Hi, my name is Armand Dodgar, and today I wanted to spend some time talking about the stages of Terraform adoption. Oftentimes we're asked by new users of Terraform, how do I take it from an individual using it to you know, a team, to many teams, to organization? And so I thought it'd be helpful to share some of the patterns we see both among our large scale users as well as our customers of how they go through the journey and the multiple stages of Terraform adoption. So when we talk about Terraform, where it usually starts is with an individual practitioner. Right? So we have an individual contributor, and they have a very tight loop, where what they do is they write infrastructure as code uh, in the form of Terraform configuration. So this is a Terraform config. And then the workflow is very prescriptive with Terraform. You write your configuration, and then you run a Terraform plan locally. This shows you what Terraform is expecting to do. Right? How does it actually need to modify your infrastructure in terms of creating things, modifying, destroying infrastructure. And it gives you an opportunity to validate the changes Terraform makes. Then once you're happy, you've inspected it and validated it, you actually make those changes. So you apply them and make the change to your infrastructure. So create, modify, destroy various infrastructure. And then much like an application, your definition of your infrastructure is a living, breathing thing. So today you deploy some set of infrastructure. Tomorrow you decide to extend it or scale it up or scale it down. And so you go back to the beginning and modify this configuration again. So we back, go back to the origin, change our configuration, and again flow through our plan and apply cycle. This is what it looks like as an individual. So now what happens as we start to go to a team? So now at the moment we go to a team, we introduce a set of collaboration challenges. So specifically, we're now modifying a single definition of what this infrastructure should look like, but we have multiple people doing it. So how do we actually ensure that we have a consistent definition of our infrastructure and that we're making these changes safely, that we're not stepping on each other's toes? And so the flow changes a little bit. It still starts with practitioners who are locally you know, writing or modifying this configuration. They might even be running a plan locally to determine, you know, are these changes safe? But now, instead of just applying it ourselves, we add an additional step, which is we now mo modify and a commit to a version control system. So this could be GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or our favorite version control system. The key is that what the version control system is doing is giving us a single source of truth. So although we may have multiple people editing this configuration at the same time, there can only be a single copy of sort of the master, the, the kind of what we're using to drive our configuration itself. So now that we have this central source of truth, we can use that and trigger off of that to apply Terraform off of that source of truth. And so this way, we get this sequential definition of what our configuration is. And there's only one change being made at a time. There's not multiple changes in parallel that might step on each other. And then once we've applied our change, we come back and restart our loop. So the things that we start to need to do at this phase is make sure we use a version control system so to have consistency of our configuration, and then drive the application of any Terraform changes off of that for consistency. So now as we go from a single team to multiple teams, what changes is now we have a decomposition we need to do, which is over here, what we really had was a single set of Terraform configurations that defined all of our infrastructure. But as we go to many teams, this starts to become impractical. There's too much coordination required, uh, and this co the configuration becomes overly complex. So instead, of what we'd like to do is hierarchically decompose our infrastructure. So we might say we have you know, one team that focuses on the underlying you know, network topology and cloud configuration. Then we might have a series of middleware. So we might have a middleware tier. And this might look at different things. right? So we might have a central solution for logging. Uh, might have a central monitoring solution. Uh, maybe we have a security appliances that we share between applications. So this is kind of the underpinning shared infrastructure that all of our applications are going to consume. You don't want every application team to reinvent how logging is done. Then at the edge, you have your actual application teams. right? So we have app one and app two as an example. And these applications are not defining any of these other components. They're not defining the network. They're not defining our monitoring. They're simply consumers of it. So as an application, I might consume some subset of this middleware. And what we've done is, on the whole, we're composing these pieces and building our application and our infrastructure. So our overall infrastructure together is all of these pieces, but we're managing it in these smaller units. And so what Terraform calls these is each of these is a workspace. 
So what we want to do is decompose this larger infrastructure into a series of workspaces and then compose them together into a larger infrastructure. Now, as we get to multiple teams, we might not want to be in a situation where you know, the application team could come in and change the definition of our network topology and just deploy a change. So on top of just separating it into independent workspaces, we begin to want to tie this back to role-based access control. So we say the networking team, they are allowed to actually modify how the networking topology works. And you know, maybe our logging team is allowed to modify what our logging middleware looks like. But these other teams, they're all consumers of it. My application has to be deployed into a network, so I need to know what the network looks like. I need to know what's my Amazon VPC, what's my subnet. So I'm allowed to give read access to these workspaces to other parts of my organization, but I want to restrict write access or the ability to make changes to the groups that should be owning and managing these individual pieces. And then when we get to the independent teams, now as an application team, I can consume all of these pieces without having to talk to them. Right? I can just consume the network, consume logging, consume monitoring, build and deploy and manage my application. And again, I might say, my team maintains both the ability to read and write, but I have a downstream application, app3, that might want to consume me and again, build out the infrastructure this way. So as we go to multiple teams, it's really about how do we allow the teams to work independently of each other, but doing that safely uh, without sort of exposing ourselves to everyone being able to make any sort of change. Now, what happens when we start to go even bigger? Right? We go from multiple teams using it to sort of an organizational level deployment of it. Right? And so here, at an org level, there's sort of a different set of governance challenges. And along with that, there's also a challenge of how do we let more people be productive, right? At this phase, we might still have most people consuming this familiar with Terraform. Whereas we go out to a full organization, uh, it's less likely that the whole organization is Terraform enabled or that you want to make that investment to train everyone. So there's kind of two answers here. The first answer is this common pattern around publishers and consumers. So what we'll start with is a limited number of publishers and what the publishers do is push into a central registry modules that basically describe how to deploy different types of infrastructure. So we might have a module that says, here's how we deploy a Java app. Here's how we deploy a C-sharp app. Here's how we deploy a database. So these, mo these publishers are pushing into this registry a definition of how do we actually deploy and manage this stuff, where this module is really packaging up an opinionated set of Terraform configuration. And now, a much larger set of consumers can basically pull this out. right? And those consumers don't have to be intimately aware of Terraform or what our pattern is. They come in and say, I have a Java application. Here's my jar file. I want three of them and deploy this to Amazon. So we might give them a few knobs that people are allowed to tweak, but then otherwise abstract all the other complexity related to it. And so this lets us scale up to a much larger number of consumers without really having to train and enable them how to write infrastructure's code or become cloud experts. So this is one side of it. The other challenge becomes, how do we allow this many consumers, this many people interacting, to do so safely? Right? We don't want people to open up the firewall and allow all traffic to come in or set their S3 bucket to you know, the universe is allowed to read from it and expose our data. So what we'd like to be able to do is, in some sense, define a sandbox and say, you're allowed to do any type of infrastructure change you want inside of a sandbox. And as long as you're within the sandbox, right? maybe you're using our pre-approved Java module, or you know, you know how to use Terraform, and so you've written your own custom thing. And as long as you're within the sandbox, you're allowed to do so. Right? You don't have to file a ticket and have a security team check and make sure this infrastructure is valid. You can make your change submit it, and go on with your way. But what we'd like to have happen is if you try and deploy something that steps outside of the sandbox, deploying to the wrong region, or bypassing security controls, we'd like the system to prevent this. And so our sort of project to focus on this was something we call Sentinel. And the idea behind Sentinel is how do we capture policy as code? And so when we talk about policy, this could be things like staging always deploys to the east region, and production always deploys to the west region, and our firewall rules must never allow traffic from the entire internet. So we can capture that as a different set of sentinel policies, right, which themselves are code, that basically describe what does our policy look like. And this policy 
is now defining the sandbox, right? Things that are not in violation of the policy are on the inside versus things that hit that sandbox limit, violate the policy, get rejected. So in a system like Terraform Enterprise, we would insert this Sentinel policy, and the system is automatically enforcing it on any change that comes through. So kind of taking a step back, what we really see is there is this gradual adoption curve, right? Where it really starts with an individual who has a tight feedback loop and doesn't have a collaboration problem. They're able to do their own plan and apply cycle locally without worrying about coordinating. The moment we start bringing multiple people on board, we need to make sure that there's a single source of truth, both for Terraform's configuration file itself, as well as as we make changes, that there's only a sequential application of changes, that we don't have people stepping on each other. So this requires some slight changes in terms of using version control and tying it back into a system that's applying changes sequentially and managing state for us. Then as we go even bigger, it's really about decomposition from a single monolithic configuration into many smaller uh, configurations that we compose together, and then tying that to role-based access control to do it safely. And then the final piece at an org level is sort of making it easy uh, for many different consumers by introducing a notion of a registry of pre-approved modules, right, a sort of service catalog, as well as governing what's actually acceptable and restricting it through policy. Because if we don't do it through policy, oftentimes what ends up happening is we create a ticketing queue where all changes are reviewed manually, and we lose the efficiency that we've gained in the sort of agile self-service infrastructure. Hopefully this was helpful in understanding the adoption journey as you use Terraform and go through these stages. And uh, you know, hopefully you'll find more resources online in terms of using Terraform and getting deeper with it. If you have some of these challenges of collaboration and governance, I'd encourage you to check out Terraform Enterprise. Thank you so much.